So let's begin. Um, today we decided to have a panel discussion highlighting the challenges that young, um, young youth are facing today. Well, young legal aspiring youths are facing today. Now, in this day's economy and job market, we are faced with a number of challenges. Mainly the legal market, the legal fraternity in South Africa is highly saturated. Well, that's not my words. That is the words of many around me. That's why many law graduates graduate to unemployment. So today we're gonna focus on mental health and how they can better prepare themselves for when they do get the job and how they should um, carry themselves and what tools to use while waiting to get that job. And not necessarily saying that uh, the job that they're gonna get is actually the one that they want, but they have to learn to have faith and keep on pushing in their studies and their job search. So today we have our lovely panelists, which is Cornelius Visser, who, was, who could make it today from the University of Wits. Advo Dr. Advocate Cornelius Visser, how are you? Fine, thanks in yourself. Great being here. Thank you so much. And then we have Advocate Zanella Anerman. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, yes, you did. Of the high Thank you. And Thank you so much. And also we have Chidisho Kale, who is an advocate at the High Court of South Africa. Hi Chidisho, how are you? And also an alumni. Hi Chidisho. Let me, hi, let me correct that. I'm a candidate attorney, not an advocate. <laughs> oh, candidate attorney. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have Kanyi Chabalala from joining us from the United Kingdom. Uh, Kanyi is a lawyer, an attorney. Do they use attorney phrases like attorneys advocates that side uh, it's called solicitor in the in the uk oh a solicitor yeah yes we're joined by kanye who's a solicitor based in the united kingdom hi kanye hi everyone yes and also um here to assist me is my exco members Cheryl zulu who is our academic um who heads up our academic and research no Sorry, my apologies. Uh, who heads up our treasury? Cheryl Zulu, how are you? I'm good, President. How are you? I'm good. And then we have uh, Nino, Nino Roda, who is studying her, her doctors, uh, studying her doctors, and is our academic researcher and secretary. Hi, Nino. How are you? Hi, everyone. Pleasure. Um, Nino, um, thank you for, for joining us. Um, let me first start off by explaining what um, SABOL is. SABOL is an NGO which um, <clears throat> is an NGO which is uh, dedicated to promoting um, <clears throat> is an NGO that is dedicated at promoting um, South Africans, um, black women and female in general, women lawyers in law. And we do this in a number of ways by also doing and, sorry, by also remembering our core principles. Oh, uh, my apologies. I seem to have forgotten what one other panelist. Um, hi, Promise, how are you? Doing great, thanks. How are you? Promise Njogu is a candidate attorney, and I'm glad to have him join us. Happy to be here. Sure. Um, yeah, Sabol is an NGO which is dedicated to promoting women and black women in law, but that doesn't necessarily that we focus primarily on women and black women. We are actually a diverse group of people who actually focus on promoting anyone who has the desire and the passion to actually practice law and yeah, to practice law and uh, one day become um, 
a very uh, a very capable legal practitioner. That was the word that I was looking for. We do this by encapsulating our core principles, which is Ubuntu and Bukuzenzele. Ubuntu, as everybody knows, it actually means humanness. It's translated from Zulu, but it means we're all together, we're all united, and we shouldn't discriminate against one another. And yeah, I would like to start this panel discussion because um, on my side, I was a time in joining. I like to apologize for that. And I would like to hand over to Nino, who is gonna introduce Dr. Cornelis Pesce. Nino, can you please Hi take it everyone. away? everyone. My name is Nino Roda, and I am an academic officer as well as a secretary general at Sabwell. Um, I have an honor today to introduce Dr. CJ Fisa. He is a senior lecturer at the Vets University School of Law. His research interests lie in the critical examination on the human personality as a legal interest from the perspective of the law of delict and the law of persons. Currently, Dr. Fisa's research focuses on dignity harms such as hate speech, defamation and insult, among others. And his research is within a transformative constitutionalism paradigm. Dr. CJ Fisa is also a co-author of the Law of Injuries online textbook. He holds an LLB from the University of Johannesburg and an LLM and a PhD from the Vet School of Law. Um, I just want to emphasize today that we are talking about different legal professions and one of those professions is lecturing. I can't emphasize enough that lecturing is so important. Um, so we cannot get to the point to be a legal practitioner um, if we if no one teaches us the laws of the country, right? So um, lecturing is so important. Um, and I want to hand to Dr. CJ Fisa to tell us more about lecturing. Um, Dr. Fisa, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for that very lovely introduction and thank you for providing context of the importance of being a lecturer. So I have provided a speech if the panel and the attendees don't mind, so hopefully it will not be too long and too boring. So just to start, good morning esteemed colleagues, aspiring legal professionals and distinguished guests. It's a privilege to be here today at this esteemed event hosted by the South African Black Women in Law, SABWOL. I'm honoured to share my journey and insights with such an inspiring community. First, I extend my gratitude to the entire SABWOL team for this invitation. Today we discuss dynamic career paths, meaningful connections and well-being in the legal profession. So let me take you on a journey, my journey to becoming a legal academic. Imagine embarking on a path filled with curiosity, creativity and bravery. Being a legal academic demands believing in your ability to make a significant contribution through teaching and research. It's about having a profound passion for a specific field of law, a field you wish to master, explore and share with others. My journey began during my undergraduate studies, where I discovered my love for the law. This passion grew as I pursued further studies and gained practical experience. Eventually, I joined the Vet School of Law as a senior lecturer, where I now shape the minds of tomorrow's legal professionals. Every day I'm reminded of the powerful impact education can have on an individual's life and society. That being said, being a lecturer is both a responsibility and a privilege. It requires constant reflection on what and how we teach. 
The challenge is to analyze complex legal materials and present them in a way that maintains their intricacy while empowering students to think critically and creatively. It's about creating an, an um, environment where students feel safe and a critical aspect of being a legal academic is finding and sharing your own unique voice. Each of us has a distinctive perspective shaped by our experiences and passions. It's essential to develop this voice and share it through research and teaching. In my early days as a lecturer, I try to emulate seasoned academics. However, my true impact came when I'm when I started incorporating my own experiences and perspectives. This authenticity resonated with my students, fostering a more engaging legal experience. Finding your voice means embracing your uniqueness and conveying your message in a way that only you can. So what attributes does a young aspiring legal practitioner need to become a legal academic? In my experience, the most critical attributes include curiosity, creativity, analytical skills, and bravery. As Rolf Waldo Emerson said, the mind once stretched by a new idea never returns to its original dimensions. Aspiring legal academics must embrace this mindset, always seeking to expand their understanding and sharing it with others. Consider former Justice Yvonne Mokoro, whose work has profoundly impacted South African law. As a constitutional court judge and legal academic, she shaped the country's constitutional jurisprudence. Her dedication to human rights and social justice exemplifies how a legal academic can bridge academia and practical reform, promoting justice and equality. Now, you might wonder what skills are essential for success in being a legal academic and how a student becomes employable in this competitive field. Success requires a combination of both hard and soft skills. Critical thinking, legal research and writing are fundamental. However, effective communication, empathy, collaboration are equally important. It's about analysing complex legal materials and presenting them engagingly and understandably. To enhance employability, engage in internships, participate, participate in mood calls, publish research and build a strong professional network. Demonstrating a commitment to lifelong learning and a proactive approach to professional development are key. As Albert Einstein said, intellectual growth should commence at birth and only cease at death. So what does a typical day of being a legal academic look like? Well, my day starts early, often reviewing sources of law or, perfect, or preparing for lectures. Then I engage with students through lectures and consultations, providing guidance on their academic journeys. Afternoons are usually reserved for research and writing, contributing to scholarly publications. Despite this busy schedule, I ensure to dedicate time for personal well-being and mental health, crucial in maintaining balance and productivity. So before I conclude, I just want to speak about the importance of mentorship. Mentorship is vital for professional development. Start by identifying potential mentors in your areas of interest. For example, professors, professionals, or senior colleagues. Networking is essential. Attend seminars, workshops, and conferences. 
and engage in meaningful conversations. Platforms like LinkedIn are invaluable for connecting with potential mentors. Approach potential mentors with respect and professionalism. Clearly articulate your goals and what you hope to achieve from the mentorship. Building a relationship with a mentor is a two-way street. Show appreciation for their time and advice. Stay engaged by regularly updating your mentor on your progress and challenges, seeking feedback and being open to constructive criticism. Remember, as Maya Angelou said, we may encounter many defeats, but we must not be defeated. Mentors provide the guidance and support needed to navigate challenges and help you achieve your goals. In conclusion, the legal professions offers a wealth of opportunities for growth, connection and contribution by cultivating the right attributes, buttes, developing essential skills and maintaining a focus on well-being. We can navigate this dynamic landscape successfully. And as an academic, I would say most importantly, find and share your unique voice. It is this voice that will inspire, educate and drive change. Thank you for your attention and time. I look forward to engaging further discussions and learning each from you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Advocate. Thank you, Advocate. I mean, Dr. Cornelius Vesa. Thank you. My apologies for that. Um, no problem. Uh, Advocate, Zan Thank you. Advocate Zanella, are you still having problems with your mic? No, it seems to be fine. All is good. If everyone can hear me, then yeah. Okay. Thank you. I would like to introduce Advocate Zanella, who is again as you already know, an advocate of the High Court and uh, advocate, uh, please, um, would you take it away? Certainly. Yes. Firstly, thank you, everyone, for attending today. But most importantly, thanks for the invite to speak today. Um, obviously, this topic is very important and critical if you want to become a lawyer and navigate the landscape of the legal fraternity and also just growth in general as a youth into your career. So as everyone already knows, I'm an advocate of the High Court um, and I'm also an uh, arbitrator and mediator. And I say this because this various ways uh, of growing your career within the law fraternity. It's not just becoming an advocate or becoming an attorney. There's other things that one can explore um, with the LB degree, given how our um, president has mentioned how saturated the, um, the legal space is, particularly in South Africa. Um, so yes, my career path to becoming an advocate is not your conventional way of I studied and then did law. I first worked first uh, before studying as an engineer at MTN and then there that's when I realized that law is what I want to do because I was involved in more dispute resolution as opposed to solutions architecture. So then I resigned, did my LB and luckily joined the bar uh, as an advocate. And through that experience, a lot has happened uh, from being a student and then joining the bar. And you would understand the skill set that comes with it, the learnings that comes with it, but also the self of awareness that, that comes with it. And that's obviously what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so one would ask, what are the attributes 
of becoming an advocate or rather just being part of, of the legal fraternity. And I, I strongly believe, and I'm just going to lay them out in sequence, uh, is dedication. You have to really understand what is it that you want within your career as a legal profession, right? The profession is very demanding, as we all would understand, from studying um from your studying purposes until you get into your whether it's an advocate whether it's in a law firm um whether even you're in-house counsel or you are in an advisory role or even a lecture it's quite a demanding um, profession primarily because there's a lot of reading there's a lot of engagement that has to happen between you and your studies, but also the collaboration within the spaces that you find yourself in your profession, right? So becoming an advocate requires significant commitment. And again, this applies to whether you're an attorney, and maybe I'm just gonna be in general on that. So young aspiring legal practitioners need to be dedicated, right, to their studies, of course, but also dedicated to the goal of, I'm studying for this, and this is where I want to be. And where you want to be is not just going to go straight into that. Maybe some people are lucky. You are immediately after your LB. You're fortunate enough to get to the top five if that's the desired goal or go to the bar if that's the desired goal. Sometimes it might take you on another pathway until you get to where you want to be. So you have to persevere in terms of what is it really that you want. And a strong ethical foundation. So strong ethical foundation is... It's law, right? We we operate. We seem to have lost advocate Zanelle. Zanelle, can you hear me? Advocate Zanella. <clears throat> can everybody else hear me? Yeah, Nino, can you hear, can me? hear you? Yes. Um, my apologies. Um, as you can as you as you can see, we're having problems with connecting, and yeah, the Teams platform today is acting up. Um, I'd like to apologize for that, and. I would hope to give uh, Advocate Zanele another opportunity when she does come back. But in the meantime, I want to move on to our next panelist. After, let me see, Advocate Zanele, can you hear me? Are you back? Okay. Um, please um, bear with me as we introduce our next panelist, who is. Apologies. Is um, a candidate attorney, uh, Promise. Yeah, Promise and Glory, uh, who's a candidate attorney from uh, Herbert Smith and Free. Or is that correct, Promise? Um, no, uh, so you're, you're referring to Kanye. I am from Baker McKenzie. Uh, my apologies. Yes, I, no, I don't worry about it. But yeah, um, um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, yes, so as you said, I did forget to send a bio. I, I, I sent to, I, I reminded myself to, but then I forgot to do that. My apologies for that. But um, just a short introduction. My name is Promising Global, and I am a first year candidate attorney at Baker McKenzie in the mergers and acquisitions team. Um, I was actually very excited to come on to this platform and talk today because uh, I saw quite a few of the panelists' uh, uh, faces that I recognize. For example, um, Dr. Fisser, you were actually my delict and uh, law of persons lecturer a couple of years ago. So it's it, it's really nice to to see you again and to. Um, kind of sit on the same side of the bench as you. So <laughs> it is, it, it's truly a great honor. And um, yes, one of my, one of the other panelists on here is Kanye, and I'm sure she'll speak a little bit later on, but um, yeah, I've known her for quite some time too, and we were in the same uh, final year class as well. Um, so I am a little bit on the, 
understanding that you know we're, we're reflecting a lot about where we are and how we get to to the to the to the, to the areas that we find ourselves in in the in the context of the law right so for me i feel like this is a good place to start from to start from um the candidate attorney role because a lot of the times you find yourselves from university aspiring to become candidates like to become attorneys a lot uh, more of my class members than less actually wanted to become attorneys and if we look at the pool of people that we actually start with versus the people that um, actually get accepted into law firms and and, and uh, start this journey on to becoming admitted especially uh, just speaking from an attorney's perspective it's seeming to become a lot more difficult to get to this point in your career like to become a candidate attorney um, so it's a good place to reflect on what uh, I feel like I did that kind of worked in my advantage to get me in this position um, one of the things I would like to highlight was a uh, the need to continuously grow yourself I think that's a common trait amongst everyone on this panel, the need and the desire to, to keep moving forward and to keep becoming a better version of yourself each with each year, with each milestone, with each uh, step in your journey. So um, I actually started my, L, my, my LLB or my, law, my legal studies in the BA law stream, but then quickly changed to LLB in the following year because I, I, I actually felt like I knew what I wanted by then because me going into a, a BA law was a sort of safe space to start and to really say you know what I want to see what it'll be like to be a lawyer at least uh, taking on two or three modules at a time but then realizing very quickly on that you know what maybe this is exactly what I want to do and then I made the I made the change uh, to do the four-year LLB stream right after that. And one of the things that was continuously said to me was, it's quite difficult to get a job in the four-year stream because um, there's this idea that people who do the four-year stream, all they know is how to be basically lawyers and, and and all they know is the legal studies they don't have anything outside of that no other practical experiences in other fields or or um that kind of uh time on their hands to to gain that experience because when you do a degree like a ba or a bcom or any other undergraduate degree it kind of allows you the the, the flexibility to work within the legal profession only to a limited capacity, but also gain experience outside of it. So that was something that was told to me as I was uh, making that change, because I did actually seek out a little bit of advice before making that change. So it was kind of a mountain to climb to, to, to overcome that kind of uh, thinking. And for me, it took um, taking up quite a lot of space in university when I was still there from various roles on uh, student committees and, and, and working at various NGO legal spaces and, and, and really trying to develop a taste and a passion for what I really wanted to do. Um, so dabbling into both public and uh, private law um, and getting to this position where making a decision wasn't just simply out of the need to get a job or the need to progress some kind of career path but doing it purely because this is something that i wanted to do and this is something that i found being where i wanted to end up with a lot of uh soul searching involved in the middle so um for me one of the toughest things to do was to study an LLB <laughs> at FITS. Um, that's been, I, I'm pretty sure Dr. Fisser can speak to just how uh, mentally taxing it can be to, to, to go through your studies under such high pressure. And I'm sure each and every university has its own um, difficulties and challenges. But uh, one of the, the, the most common thing that, that we, we say at WITS is when you graduate actually is you've conquered the edge. 
right? And <laughs> that that generally means you you've overcame the difficulty of getting a degree <laughs> at Vince. And um, it's, it's, it's kind of like a badge of honor at the end of the day. But you do get to a point where it does get overwhelming. It does get confusing. You know, it's very easy to in that system and in that matrix. And um, for a lot of people, it's, it's getting lost in what other people want as opposed to what they actually want to do for themselves. Because um, uh, another example of it is when we were in first year and uh, on my first day, I had no clue what I wanted to do in law. Um, I just sat in the class and said, you know what, let's figure it out. Intro to law 101, let's do this. And I'm hearing all of these ideas of, hey, so have you, have you, have you thought about the kind of law firms you want to work at? Or have you thought about um the big five or have you thought about all of these so you're getting a lot of students that are coming in here and throwing a lot of ideas your way and now you're so confused because it initially maybe you wanted to become a i don't know a prosecutor or you wanted to become a criminal defense attorney and then now you're hearing all about this the, the, the glamorous life of a big five law firm so it can get confusing right there in the middle and then you while you're facing this this existential crisis of career, you're now faced with um, the mental, the mentally taxing work of having to get through the studies while also dealing with a lot on the on the other side. So um, I do feel like that was an important part of my own journey and speaking on the topic of mental health you know i was able to use a lot of the university's facilities uh, to to assist me to actually better balance myself um so we do have the career counseling and development unit that was available to us we did have um the campus health that was available to us and making use of those services really did um help me slow down the pace a lot and to spend a lot of time thinking and 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 working towards the idea of what I wanted to do. So um, hey, look who's, who's joined by video. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't want to take up too much of time, too much of everyone's time. But um, I do want to say that it is it is quite important to, to introspect a lot before getting to make very difficult decisions. Because yes, we are. Um, young people and, I, and i'd like to think that a lot of the, uh, the the viewers that we have right here the attendees are people who are trying to get into the legal profession or people who are somewhere in their studies they uh, i'm not sure at what levels but i do have that one piece of advice to say spend a lot of time thinking about where you want to find yourself in your career because it really won't help you if everyone else is satisfied with your progress except for you so um, I'm happy to answer any questions at, at any point. I'm not sure if the program does allow for a Q&A session, but happy to answer any questions that anyone may have and to engage a little bit more with everyone else. But um, thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, that was me. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Promise. Uh, that was lovely. That was lovely. And I hope everybody can hear me. And yeah. The, the journey is definitely long and it's filled with all kinds of twists and turns. And luckily, most of you did make it. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, nobody talks about the mental health that is involved in uh, the whole process, but it requires a lot of fortitude. It requires people to focus on where they're going and the task that they do. Thank you very much. And as for your question about the answers and questions, uh, we're going to do it at the end. Um, those who have questions for a particular panelist can just write them down in a book or somewhere. And then later on, type it while we're still doing the video. And we will we'll give the floor to them after we're, we're done with the whole program. So the next panelist, I'm just waiting for her to appear. The next panelist is Chidisho. TV show? Are you online? Oh, 
Yes, I am online. Uh, are you having issues with your camera? I don't see, I don't see. Uh, no, no, no. I was just waiting to see myself on the bottom of my screen. Uh, and I'm guessing you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. It's wonderful. Uh, Show, please. please take it I away. Mean, Yes, my name is Sidi Shokale. I'm currently a candidate attorney. Uh, I've been, it's my first year. I've been on for, I think it's 11 months now. Next month going into uh, the 12th month of my uh, journey as a CA. Um, and where I would like to start with this conversation is start by agreeing with two points that were made earlier. There's one point by the president when he said uh, the legal profession is saturated and I, he did quote where he got that authority and that's true but what I would like to add on to that is saturation does not necessarily mean that you as an aspiring legal practitioner there's no space for you if you can upskill yourself and 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 present yourself in a in a wonderful light there is definitely space for you Secondly, uh, Dr. Fisser mentioned a point about mentorship, and I think that was a really great point. One needs to align themselves with mentors and people that they can relate with, so as to ensure that you've got you've got a buddy that can assist you along the way when you are when you go when you're going through your journey. Now, as I was preparing for today, I thought, in as much as it's talking about a journey, let's not take it from the be- from the beginning in terms of your studies. Let's take it from the day that you graduate. Um, and what are the skills that are necessary after the day that you graduate? And from there on, um, while well, taking the questions that were provided into consideration, I would first like to talk about the attributes that are necessary for, and, and I'm talking about this in the sense of one being a candidate attorney. What are the necessary attributes that one needs to have? And from that, one of the most important attributes that I could gather is patience. One needs to be patient with themselves as they're going through this journey of seeking for articles, because it's not easy. Um, I consider myself one of the lucky few candidates, because from the day that I walked through the UNISA stage graduating to the day I started my articles, it was about a three-month period. So one needs to be very patient as they're going through that. Um, another thing, once you learn your articles, you need to be very patient because you need to remember that you are learning as you're there. So everything is still new and every day is a new opportunity for you to learn something new. But while you're being patient, you need to be resilient because you're learning. There are people there who are there to assist and in assisting, it's going to look like they're judging. Uh, more especially your principal. You produce a piece of work, you look at it and you're like, this is the next best thing in the legal profession. You take it to your principal because they've got the ultimate authority over the work that you do and they're like, nope, 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 you can do better. So you need to have a thick skin. Um, Where also you need to have a thick skin is as you are navigating your journey as a CA, you're going to meet a lot of different people. Like the courts, security at the courts and those guys because they've been there longer than you've been they know better than you so you need to be able to get there and listen to sometimes authority that they provide while it may seem like uh, it's unfounded but it assists because it assists with uh, it, it you, you need to adhere to it because it assists with the running of that place where you are trying to find your feet and thirdly, I want to talk about reliability, and this is still in terms of attributes. You need to be reliable. This is to both the people you'll be working with at the firm once you are uh, taken as a candidate attorney, but also to your clients as well. You need to, and, and I think Professor, uh, Dr. Fisser, I don't know if I can say Professor because <laughs> Professor just keeps coming to hit, um, mentioned the issue of effective communication or, or the, the aspect of effective communication and this is one of the biggest feats of, of being reliable you need to be a, you need to be able to be a conduit of information relay the information that you have to your client 
And once they relay the information to you, relate to your principal as you are producing work so that everyone is on the same page. And then advocate uh, Zanella before we lost her. She spoke about being an ethical person. And alongside being ethical, you need to be because a lack of being an ethical individual and, and lack of being honest would mean that you effectively end your career even before it starts. So you need to be careful of things like that. And for me, those are the most important attributes. But now, these are the attributes. Let's take it as say you've just got what are the most important skills that you need to have as you are seeking employment and for me what i have found to be the most important skill is the skill of self introspection uh one may put quality uh because you need to be able to look within yourself and measure what is or, or rather measure your inadequacy and then upskill the point in which you are finding to be your inadequacy. Because it is only through being able to improve that you can present yourself, that, that you'll be able to present yourself in the best possible light, especially as you are seeking employment. <clears throat> but, or rather, the next point, what, I'm, what I've noticed is that there are candidates who, who graduate then seek employment, but when they go for an interview, they do not know the basics. So don't do that to yourself. Ensure that you know the basics. And by this, I mean Civil Procedure 101. You need to know the difference between an application and an action. You can't show up and say you, you're looking for employment as a candidate of tenure to begin your legal career, but you do not know the basics, right? If, if, if that's the case, then you are basically excluding yourself from that opportunity. So ensure that you know the basics, civil procedure 101, and that's that's very important. But lastly, you need to skill yourself in terms of um, in terms of mooting, which I think Subwell offers. Uh, not I think I know because <laughs> I've done two moots with Subwell, and I've all, we've also assisted with organizing one. So you need to ensure that you take on those skills so that. When you walk in on your first day, and as much as you are there to learn, you also have some skills that you're bringing along. And uh, yeah, that, that brings me to the end of my address. Uh, I think when it comes to a typical day, uh, let's save that for the q and I think it will be probably more interesting for, for the Thank you very much for the opportunity, President. Thank you, Chidi Show. Thank you. And sorry for jumping you into the front of the line like that. But I'm glad to see you are prepared. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're moving on. But what you said was very interesting. Um, please be mindful. All uh, aspiring uh, candidate attorneys uh, or people who are waiting in line to get the articles that you do have a skill that you learned from school. And that skill is going to serve you well, and it is of great importance. For starters, your research skills are very, very invaluable. And please, please focus on practicing those. So I would like to introduce our next panelist. Our next panelist is Kanyisile Daba. Hi, Kanyi. Sorry, I don't know. If... Hi, how are you? Yes. Um, sorry about that. No that. stress, <laughs> no stress at all, no stress at all. Tangi, please introduce yourself and tell them all about yourself and what you want to teach them to. <laughs> teach is a, it's a very big task, but I'll try. Um, hi, my name is Kanye Sile. Um, I am a first year, I think colloquially it's referred to as a candidate attorney, but internally we're referred to as trainees. <laughs> um, I currently am doing my articles um, at an international law firm, Herbert Smith Freehills. Um, and yeah, that's just about me. I actually graduated from both Stellenbosch and WIT. So Dr. Fisser actually taught me both delict and personal law. Um, 
Um, and um, yeah, and I know Promise as well from there. I know Nino as well. Um, so yeah, this is actually a very small but great community. Um, so today, um, so basically attributes. I think what's important to understand is that the in as much as I think people are saying that it's saturated, um, it, it also requires you to show more than just the basics, right? And so um, it doesn't mean that you're locked out. It just means that, you know, the stakes are now higher, the standard has risen a little bit, and you kind of have to be more than just an LLB, right? Um, and that just goes to personality-wise, that goes to extramural curricula. So being part of societies like this, puts you one step further. Um, I think I was having conversations with our HR team and basically they say that they're looking for more than just a degree at this point um, because anybody can study the law. It sounds horrible. It's it's from us knowing and going through it, it's, it's quite a difficult um, feat, but their perspective is everybody can study the law and anybody can be taught the law. It's how you apply it and how you practice it that makes you different, right? Um, and and so you you really need to, I mean, when you think about attributes, that's what you need to be putting at the forefront. So um, those recommended readings are, are stuff that you're supposed to look into to, you know, sharpen your skills, to make you see a more holistic picture of the course that you're taught. I think often when you speak to students, it's just, oh, I just want to get a 50 and I just want to pass. I just want to meet the minimum criteria. But the attitude that you should be having is, I actually want to learn more and expand my knowledge so that if I'm dropped in an ocean, I know how to swim. Um, because in practice, you go from, you know, in, in varsity, you go from, oh, read this case so that you can understand this principle. In practice is, this is the principle, find me the case. So it's it's really, really important for you to be able to go the extra mile. And I don't think you're able to do that if you're just trying to get the bare minimum, right? So things like extramural curricula, putting yourself out there, asking questions in lectures, um, helps you kind of craft skills and soft skills that you'll need in practice. Um, also feeding yourself things um, outside of your circle. So I always live by the affirmation of if you're the smartest person in the room, you need to find a bigger room. Um, because I think we're always, there's always room to grow. There's always room to learn. Um, and I think that when you adopt that skill, you kind of, you know, flourish. Um, you, you, you build more, you increase your horizons. Um, and I think that that's what throwing yourselves into deep end means. And I think for me, that kind of played out as model UN um, or mooting. I'm not really a great public speaker, but I push myself to be um, because, you know, you always have to conquer the edge per se <laughs> or um, do things that are out of the ordinary um, and just to help you grow as a person and I think that when you challenge yourself in those ways things that are not necessarily innately comfortable at first um, you either find something that you really love or you develop a skill you never knew you had and so I think to sum it up in terms of attributes on how to be I suppose career ready or viable for the industry is to go the extra mile, to do things that, you know, your other classmates aren't really either prepared to do or are not in the, are not willing to do, you know, um, I think just going the extra mile helps a lot. And that in turn speaks to you as a person. Um, and then it gives you stuff to talk about in an interview, because at the end of the day, they're trying to figure out who you are as a person and what you can contribute to the firm. I think also coming from, I suppose it speaks to the bargaining power of being a varsity student and kind of feeling like you're begging for a job. But I think the understanding is that they're getting something from you and you're getting something from them. It's a mutual relationship, right? And so when you're in a mutual relationship, you have to bring something to the table and they bring something as well. So if you gear your mind to thinking that way to say, okay, cool, when I walk into an interview room, what can I say I'm bringing to the relationship? Because they're bringing the articles, the knowledge, the experience, the exposure into the industry. What am I bringing? Why am I an asset? Why am I mutually viable for this relationship? And I think once you start answering those questions for yourself, you'll start to figure out things 
about yourself and things that you need to fix as well, because I think we're all works in progress. So I think those are really, really great attributes um, to have um, in preparing for, for that. And then um, we we're told to just walk you through a regular day. Um, so a regular day is, before I say that, I think these platforms are actually incredibly um, important because I want to just at the forefront say that there's more to life than big five. Um, I just wanted to say that out there because a lot of students feel like if I don't make it into a big five law firm, I'm doomed. Like my career is over. Um, there's nothing for me to do. Genuinely, there is more to life than big five. And I think that once you start to step into those conversations and start to have conversations like this that expose you to more than just big five, you'll realize that maybe big five is not for me, you know? Um, I kind of was fortunate enough to be part of conversations like this that I realized Big Five is not for me, um, <laughs> but international law is. Um, and, and reaching that kind of platform was really key for me. So I think when also looking for what's next beyond law school, have a real conversation about what it is you want to achieve, what are your interests, and figure out a firm or an institution or a pathway that aligns with that, right? Um, and so that's why for me, an international law firm just worked best. You know, you might, you know, get in a conversation and people are like, you work where? Um, <laughs> but it's okay because the exposure that you're getting, you know why you're there, right? And it, and it's, it's, it's very easy. I know in law school, it's very common for, I suppose it's bragging rights. Like, oh, I work at ENS, the biggest law firm in Africa, or I work here and there. Um, but sometimes I think it's the value that you get whatever firm or whatever institution that you're getting from that's important. Um, I think um, try to remember and humble yourself in that experience and that always remember that each experience is a unique experience, right? Um, your friends might end up as partner, but you might be some big shot in some in-house in legal, or you might be overseas, or you might be in a lecture hall, but we're all making significant strides in shaping and changing the law, right? Um, so a typical day for me as a CA or a trainee is um, we attend capacity meetings, and I think these are so important because they basically map out um, what everybody's doing, what matters people are working on, and where we are in terms of how much work we can take on. And I think this is an absolutely amazing opportunity because we're then allowed to say, oh, I would like to participate in that matter that you're doing. Please, can you pull me on in this week? Um, and things like that. Um, so that's really, really fun. Um, and then after, I think what I really enjoy about there being less of us at my firm is that it's hands, it's more direct hands-on experience with your partner. So I will attend the partner meetings that he attends with clients. And it's always great to know because there's so little of us, um, whatever instruction comes out of that meeting, I have to do, which now is goes back to going the extra mile, right? You're drafting things you've never seen before. You're reading documents you've never seen before, right? And when you think about going the extra mile, it's okay, before I cry for help, let me go on Lexus Nexus and see precedents on share for share agreements and explain to myself what a share for share agreement is. So that when I go to my partner saying, hey, I, I don't actually understand what it is you're trying to make me draft. I have a basis on which I'm asking this, not necessarily that I'm just throwing my toys out of the cart and saying, oh, I've never seen this before. I can't do it. I've gone the extra mile. I've researched. I've then gotten stuck. And then I'm going to seek for help and trying to get clarity on things. And then it becomes a conversation, right? Because then you might have read something and said, okay, but I didn't understand why they structured their share for share agreement like this. And then he goes into, oh, there's different schemes, right? And that's why this one looks different and that one looks different. Um, so so there's that. And, and I think always another piece of advice that goes into what goes into the other day, never be afraid of the unknown. There's going to be lots of things that are unknown. You just have to kind of hone yourself, pull yourself towards yourself and try to figure out step by step, right? An elephant isn't eaten in a minute. It takes a few bites, right? So work on chunks and chunks and then eventually will become, you know, 
something great. Um, and then it's more drafting, more reading, lots of research. So Lexus Nexus and those lectures that they tell you to attend are super important um, because, you know, you're asked to go look for a case with no case number with about some arbitrary judgment that's judge so and so said this in the byline that's the case that I want and if you don't you know hone those skills again going the extra mile attending those non-compulsory classes for research is what feeds into you being equipped for practice um and 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 that's just basically the day and then just you know talking and conversating with people of who are of a senior position and just trying to get in as much knowledge so I think to sum up very, very broadly, what I'm saying is it's really important to, one, understand your position and what you bring to the relationship. And secondly, always go the extra mile. But yes, that's any if, if there are any questions for me, I'll answer them when we have time to answer them. But thank you. Thank you, Kanye. Kanye Sile, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for highlighting the skills that you actually utilize that you learn. Like you said, like fully making sure that you attend those classes. Um, those classes were actually quite pivotal. I now, as I look back as what I do, because I'm not a candidate attorney, I'm actually sort of, I, I guess I can count as an in-house counsel, but not really. I'm a legal intern at a, a property financier company. So those skills have definitely served test of time and I am asked every now and then to do research on a certain matter because they are always going to be relevant because those are the skills that you can tweak to fit whatever problems that you're facing at any moment. So yeah and oh for those attending um yeah drafting is important. Please remember drafting is very important. You're gonna draft all sides all sorts of documents in all types of ways depending on the company that you're in they differ and the wording differs and just remember that your school actually prepared you for this. So I actually wanted to introduce again um, Advocate Zanelle. Advocate Zanelle, are you on? Is everything sorted? Yes, I'm or? on, but I'm not going to turn my camera on because I'm having serious tech issues. I don't know if everyone can hear me. I apologize for the technology. Issue clearly my mastery in technology, sir. But <laughs> be that as it may, um, just to continue where I was, if you could just let me know if you can hear me, that would be great. Okay, good. Sorry again. Um, as I was saying, so where was I? I was on the attributes, right, of a legal practitioner, and I was talking more general, whether advocate or an attorney or in-house counsel. Um, so I mentioned the yes. strong ethical foundation right, in terms of integrity, being rule bound, but also understanding your flexibility and your um, skill sets that you can bring to the table. As much as you are the table, but you also have to bring something to the table. Um, and another aspect would be your analytical thinking, the ability to analyze complex legal issues. And this comes with practice and time. It doesn't just happen uh, when you're a student. The more you practice this, the more um, you are able to be dynamic in terms of how you apply legal principles uh, and obviously your analysis in those legal principles. Um, the last lady that was speaking, she spoke about drafting. Uh, and persuasive drafting comes again from practice and being able to analyze your facts properly and apply them uh, to the law. And the next thing is excellent communication skills. This goes without saying, your written and oral communication has to be key. More so, obviously, as advocates, we need to be persuasive in thought in our argument, but also I would assume in an office setting, the same also applies in terms of your communication. Try to be, I know that everyone thinks our oh, law is so complex and I need to draft in a manner that is so difficult, um, but not really. But great for judges that write really compelling judgments, uh, explain that when you comes to legal drafting, the most key thing is simplicity. And obviously, you have to be brave for you to be able to write in simple terms. Um, so just being, understanding that simplicity is key and um, 
communication and persuasive speaking is, 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 is key. The next thing is adaptability and resilience. Which I think this is part of the talk today, being able to be very adaptable to the situation that you find yourself, right? So that means if you want to go the extra mile, or can you go the extra mile? And resilience goes hand in hand with that. The legal field, the legal field is obviously an ever changing, evolving space to be in. The, the law changes every other, if not every day. Uh, so you need to adapt to that, but also just yourself as an individual, and this goes to the wellness part. You also evolve as a human being and you understand yourself with time as it goes. So being able to be adaptable, being resilient is one of the attributes that I would say um, are, are quite important. And then attention to detail. I think we hear this all the time at Varsity and don't think it ends when you work, right? Attention to detail is, is so important. And this means you read and reread and reread again, even if you think your document is perfect. Just getting, whether it's your friend or whether it's someone else, some other set of eyes to go through your work is key. Um, that goes to attention to detail. And interpersonal skills, I think also the last lady mentioned in interviews. This is one of the biggest things that when you go into an interview for work setting, everyone wants to understand what are your interpersonal skills or try to find out how does this person deal with, whether it's colleagues, stakeholders, um, um, yeah, just your professional ethics. How do you deal with your interpersonal skills? But as a young person, I think we, we lack that at varsity because at varsity it's more on the, the hard skills, learning everything else. What about your soft skills? So I, I would urge everyone else to really, really pay attention to that because that's very, very important. And then in terms of research skills, that comes without saying you need to be able to research. And, and this is like really in-depth researching. So you need to be a very good friends with all the resources that are there, due to Alexis Nexus, Subinet, everything else. That has to be something that is innate to you to do, um, whether it's on a daily basis, even for leisure, just being able to go check, oh, what is the latest on this topic? Or how does a case summary look like? Um, those things. I generally have different subscriptions, and those subscriptions are kind of in would send like what is the latest case on this even if I'm not working on that case I'll still be because it also just cultivates my legal analysis my legal application of um, the legal principles the next thing is obviously this is uh, deals with advocacy right this includes the ability to be able to present your case effectively in court cross-examination but this you will learn if you are becoming an advocate uh, if you join the Johannesburg Bar, that is, they had this very, very amazing, also very scary when you are in it. Uh, it's called advocacy training, and you get the set of trainers who give you a scenario, and they sit there, and you are now supposed to, you are in court, do the whole process. And as a young person, you go through that, and I think there's also moot courts that um, students are currently part of. If you can be part of that, I would advise that. Um, you do that. Time management, important. <laughs> we, as students, we think we have all the time in the world to do whatever we want to do. That's true, but also not true in the sense that you want to get some. So time management is key, and this is going down to the details of everything that you want to do. You need to be able to apply and manage your time very, very well, um, whether advocate, student, that's just basic life uh, skill that one should possess. And your continuous understanding that you have to constantly be open-minded in terms of learning. Learning never ends. After your LLB, after your master's, whatever, it just never ends. And learning is not just in varsity. Learning is in within your surroundings, right? Um, your colleagues, your friends. Learning is just constant. And I think we live in a um, space where information overload is present, right? So in your learning, take what is applicable to you and how then you can apply it to succeed, right? Um, and then I have to talk about my life, what do I do in a day? 
Um, yeah, so my life, what I do in a day, I have kids. So I wake up, make sure my kids are fine, go to school and everything else. Um, and then prior to that, I would have prepared for the next day because, again, this goes to wellness. I think everyone is always not everyone, maybe some people don't have anxiety. Or, okay, I need to prepare what's going on in the next day. So I would generally at night make sure that I've prepared not only my kids' lunch, but also just for my personal um, growth within my space. So that goes with what consultations do I have? What client do I have? What kind of research and preparation in terms of what discussions are we going to have in those consultations? If I have a consultation in the next day, um, and then if I do have thoughts, which I hardly really go for, I do more arbitration and mediation. Um, so if I do have thoughts, my preparation would have already been quite clear because you would have drafted your documents by then. But it's just obviously then preparing your analysis and how you would um, present your case if I am going to court. But if it's also arbitration, I think the same applies. I would do generally the same thing and in the mediation. Um, so that's the previous night. The next morning, my kids are prepared to to school. Uh, and then if it's a consultation, I go to that consultation. If court generally happens in the morning, I do that. And if it's an arbitration, I do that. But what I just want to re-emphasize is that in doing that, I go to the gym. And this goes to my wellness. I try to go to the gym as much as I can. Because I understand that exercise, yeah. eating healthy now and then, not all the time, it's very good for our brain. The brain that really has, has um, legal personalities. So, yeah, I go to the gym and then I do some sort of meditation. And it's really not like a long session, but it also just gives me the time to reflect on where I'm at and what I want to do. And like, you would be thrown with different, if you are in court, how do you then respond to something that is like, oh, I haven't prepared that part, or I don't know what to say now. So just, yeah, cultivating, and that's mediation. I mean, sorry, meditating really helps uh, with that. And then I'm in meditation, whether it's court, I deal with that as it comes. Um, and then I would have in the day as well, sometimes, to reflect now, if I'm done with that consultation report, reflect a little bit before I have to pick up the kids. <laughs> and then it's normally lunch and everything else. But in the evenings, I do set up time after the kids have gone to bed to check my day and do okay. some sort of reading. And yeah, luckily some people can read for leisure. But in most cases, I like to do things, whether it's on a, a case research, or maybe I like reading a lot of books from other legal uh, uh, authors, and that helps with my writing. It, that's really, really clear. Yeah, and I've seen that, <laughs> that persuasive writing comes from looking at other people's style and reading how they write. And the fortunate part about being a, at the bar as an advocate is that you get to work with different people. And you learn their different styles of crafting, how they persuade in, in their writing. And you adapt, obviously, whatever works for you, and you leave what doesn't work. You don't have to be a genius and take everyone's style, but you need to read other people's styles for you to find your own. And I like the other speaker, the first, uh, the doctor speaker, who spoke to the, uh, the notion of finding your voice. And this also comes every day, how you would find your voice. And then the last thing is, it's important to note that you don't really need to be a lawyer, an advocate, or in-house counsel. There's other opportunities for all of you and students. Look at those opportunities. And whether maybe you start as in a attorney, whether it's big class, medium firm, whichever firm that it is, and whether it's even maybe you do join the bar, it's also a direct, it's also like a journey of your own personal growth and development. So see it as maybe it's a springboard to work you being a legal advisor for, for instance, the IPP, the infrastructure, or maybe one day even having your own, whether it's a 
need or firm or dismiss. So yeah, just keeping an open mind, but persevere and don't let like maybe your downfalls, which you will have, um, get you down or some sort of disappointment will get you down. You're already far enough if you are studying towards whether it's an LD or a deeper you're far enough, then you're closer to your dream uh, than, than what you think. Because at that time, everything was just a big mountain. Mountain, you don't just jump in there with the highest point. You have to climb. And through that time, you can be very, very tired. You can all of a sudden have energy. And it's exactly the same thing when you're doing it. Um, and also have a, a outside work. Find something else that motivates you, makes you happy outside your dreams of becoming the best lawyer or dreams of just becoming a normal. Have something else that, that makes you happy and you'd find that that is going to feed into your professional as well. So that's in a nutshell, before my network again cuts off, um, that's, that's all I have to say. And I thank you once again for the opportunity and I wish everyone the utmost well and greatness in your career, and you have it. The fact that you're here on a Saturday, that's the, the that's the determination. That um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Advocate Zanella. Thank you. Uh, I like the fact that you touched on having a good work and life balance because it's very important. Because when you start, you're going to be um, overcome with thoughts that you have to perform, you have to work long nights and all that. But even at your work, they're gonna they're gonna remind you always. Please find a balance because they don't want to see you, and and I don't think any workplace wants to see you burn out as a new joinee who just graduated. So please remember to keep a good work life balance even when you do get a job. And remember, in a law firm, in a corporate company you have to make time for yourself and the people around you will not tell you when to make time for yourself. So please keep in mind that at the end of the day, we might tell you that you have to find balance. At the end of the day, you have to put it on yourself to find a way to find that balance. So next, I'm going to introduce our next panelist. And our next panelist is Kanyi Chavalala. Hi, Kanyi. Hello. Kanye. Um, Kanye, I think your role here is a little bit different from the other panelists. Your role here is basically stem off from your work as a solicitor in the UK, but also your other, um, I don't know, from, from your other part participation in other organizations that you've started. Sure. Uh, thanks, John. And um, thanks so much for the invite. I'm really honored to be part of this panel today. Um, I too have actually been lectured by uh, Dr. Fisser as well. So it does feel like quite a 360 moment, although it was a, it was a while ago. Um, I realized from listening to people's journeys, I think I, um, I've been doing this almost a decade. So my experience is quite lengthy. Um, I just want to backtrack a little into my experience, but I'm only going to focus on sort of the international side of things uh, because that again sort of goes hand in hand into the work that I'm doing now around well-being. So I started off my legal career in South Africa. I worked at ENS um, as a candidate attorney. I was in the banking and finance department. Um, I don't want to get too much into firm's reputation. I know when everybody hears that, they think, wow, like, how are you still okay? Um, it's all fine. <laughs> I made it through that experience. And from then, I had already had questions, I think, to myself about how does one pursue this career at the highest level, but also maintain who they are? Um, because I could see a lot of, I would say, people who were ahead of me were not sort of emulating personality traits or characteristics that I necessarily wanted to embody. And one of my mentors who was an associate at the time said to me that as a person, you're going to be tested along this journey many times. 
And you need to decide whether you're going to be the kind of lawyer who replies all to an email and exposes your counterpart for what they've done wrong, or whether you're going to pick up a phone and try and resolve it behind closed doors. And for me, that's something that always stuck out to me because I think the journey that comes with being in these high pressured environments does require you to disconnect from a lot of your humanness. And you're going to have to work extremely hard to keep connected to your humanness because the environment doesn't want that. Um, it's extremely competitive and it's been that way from law school. I mean, everybody in this panel is talking about how competitive it is and you're going to be confronted with whether you're going to throw your fellow candidates, attorney or colleague under the bus. And it's not going to be once. It's going to be multiple times in your career and people won't, I'll tell you, they're not even going to bat an eyelid uh, to throw you under the bus to get ahead. So that makes a lot of working in the legal industry quite difficult. Um, if I'm going to take it a step further, if you're a South African lawyer and you want to go and compete in the international market, you have no allies in that market. Nobody owes you anything. You've come from the outside as a foreign lawyer. Um, you kind of have to stand on your own. And that's where I think a lot of what's being discussed in this panel comes into play. Having that confidence, that self-esteem, engaging in those self-care practices, because unfortunately, why, what do people owe you? You're the one that wanted the job. You wanted to move overseas. Um, so you kind of have to learn how to hold yourself in that environment. And that's why for me, self-care practices and looking after your mental health is so important because everyone in this panel and listening is very ambitious and there's absolutely nothing wrong with being ambitious but as i say you need to learn how to take care of yourself because the road is extremely long so one of the things i would say that is critical for anybody on the panel uh, any candidate to, aspiring candidates attorneys listening for me i would think the most vital characteristic that you need to have is agility because you're going to have to learn how to pivot at multiple points of your career and this is where i want to sort of tie in my own experience uh because i think it might help some people listening you know um, when i was at ens i wanted i really wanted to work within the london market at that point however it was too much of a stretch at the time. You know, there was a, uh, the economy wasn't doing that well. And I know that's hard to imagine because everyone thinks the economy is not doing well. No, back then in uh, 2018, it was even worse. Um, there was no deals in the market. And for me as a banking and finance lawyer, it's, it's quite critical that there are actually deals in the market because that actually affects the nature of my experience and the quality of work that I, I'm going to get exposed to, right? So I wanted to make the move overseas, but that then required me to move to another firm, which is Weber Wenzel, which has an international in alliance uh, with Linklaters with the hopes that, okay, you know, I could possibly get a secondment to London and make that dream happen for me in that way. And when I got to Weber Wenzel, that didn't happen. Right, Weber Wenzel wasn't actually able to provide me with that secondment opportunity. And again, this is why for me, I am very much an advocate of you maintaining your mental health because the journey is such a long one. I, in my mind, thought, okay, I'll work three years at Weber Wenzel because that's usually the time that it takes for your post qualification. If you want to move overseas, you have to have done three years as an associate in South Africa, right? But these are things that you need to keep in mind because it's good to have goals, but how are you going to sustain yourself over that three year period? It's not like people are going to make it easy for you. Oh, sure, John wants to work um, here for three years so he can go to London. Yeah, let's give him that. That's not what's going to be happening. You're going to be navigating a whole bunch of impossible circumstances at all times, right? And that was what it was for me. So the opportunity is not presenting itself. I've set my timeline, I need to pivot. I put myself out there in the market and I had an opportunity in Sydney, Australia. And when I told people, 
I had such negative responses because everyone was like, who goes to Australia? What are you going to be doing there? And there was just so much backlash when it came to my decision of wanting to pursue that international experience. And again, that's me setting the building blocks for what I want my career to look like. Okay. I ignore the noise and I make my way to Sydney, Australia. And I was at um, Ashes in Sydney. And again, my self-care and me, my mental health became even more critical because as I say, I was now purely on my own. Um, one of the things I will say is that in South Africa, we have such a great camaraderie because I mean, we've got platforms like this. I never had this at my time. So much of what I've experienced, I've experienced alone. And that's why, I mean, for me, this is an amazing platform to have to actually share some of that knowledge and, and engage in that community because that's I haven't had community since I've left South Africa. That's just the reality of the job, right? As I said, it's very competitive. But at least in South Africa, we've got the Ubuntu overseas that doesn't exist. You know, you're coming in as a foreigner and people are like, well, you know, you're going to do your time. We're going to get as much out of you as we can. So work-life balance becomes hard. I mean, I had no work. I've had no work balance since I've gone overseas. It's impossible. I've worked the transactions. I've slept at 2 a.m. continuously. For those that understand how quickly finance transactions move, nobody cares that you're tired. Nobody cares that you want to rest. You've got deliverables that need to be met. But again, for me, I will always ask myself the question or, or sort of pose, my, pose the question to myself that is this still in alignment with what I want to do? And am I still the same Kanye who walked into the law in 2016? Because to be very honest, I never want to get to a point where I look back at the, my 2016 self and I don't even remember who I was. I personally am never going to put myself in a position where I allow any external circumstance to come in and alter that for me. So after, uh, during the Australian experience, which was quite turbulent, um, we had the pandemic and the borders were closed down. So unfortunately, I didn't even have the opportunity to visit South Africa once while I was there for the whole continuous two years, right? And that was very difficult because it's the first time for me, I'm a very family orientated person. Um, I like community. I like talking to people. I like my friends. I didn't have any of that. But I had the mammoth task of attempting to requalify as, as an Australian lawyer. So I had already registered to do it. And, you know, it's something that my grand always used to say to me because I was having a really difficult time and I would always say to them like I just want to come home but the problem is you going home is now a one-way flight because there's no coming back in you know and again through that experience it doesn't mean that my work is on hold I'm still getting briefed on matters I'm still doing my work I'm still sleeping late and on top of that I'm now also studying but my grand said to me think about every single black um aspiring lawyer or lawyer who will see that you went to Australia and requalified, you're doing it for them. You're giving them hope that it can be possible. And that's, again, for me, something that I would say you need to consider as an aspiring attorney or along your attorney journey. What is your why? For me, I think I've been lucky because my why is always bigger than me. When I was in Australia, it was never about myself. It was about myself. I would have flown home like December 2023 because I was over it. I didn't want to do it. But because of you guys, for me to be able to sit in a panel like this today and say, don't give up. It's never going to be easy. And we should never hope that it's, be, it's, it, it's easy. We need to hope that we gain that resilience, that tough skin within ourselves so that we're able to face any situation that's going to be thrown at us because like i say it is very difficult and it only gets worse um after australia i then moved to london and london again has had its own set of um, impossible circumstances that i've had to navigate but again at all times i'm always asking myself the question what is in alignment for me what is it that i want to do and that's what led me to found Seize the Light.
Now, I do want to say that for me, I had the aspiration of being a partner at a law firm. But to be honest, the only reason I wanted to be a partner is because in my mind and how society, with how society is constructed, people only listen to people with big titles. And that annoys me so much because I, I learn from anybody. I really don't, I'm not precious about where I'm getting my learning from. I learn from people where I get my groceries from. I sometimes tell them about a problem I have in my life. And you'll be so surprised at the solutions that they can come up with for you because they're not in the situation. They, they, they are so far away and distant from your circumstance. They may be able to say, you know what, have you tried this? So that's one of the things that I personally am not too hung up on is titles. But initially, I honestly thought that was the hill that I want to die on. I want to be a partner of a law firm because I want to have a voice and I need the title. And I'm glad that I was wrong about that. I'm glad that I gave myself the platform to have my voice because in founding Seize the Light and finding my voice in this way, it means so much more to me. And I think I'm standing so much stronger and so much firmer because I'm doing it on my own versus, of course, having that support that comes with um, working with an organization. I love working alongside organizations and that's that's given me all the fulfillment that I have now in helping others seize the light within themselves and see their full potential. Because that's one thing, again, I think right now, many South African youth are focusing on the problem and not the solution. The market is oversaturated. I'm telling you now, it's always been it's always been like that. I, my mom and I have had a very tumultuous relationship because she never wanted me to pursue law in the first place because of the oversaturation. These are stats that we've known for years, right? But I do think that you, if you believe that you have something unique to bring to the table, it's imperative that you hone in on all of those skills, and that's why I genuinely believe your personal development, your interpersonal skills, your networks, your discipline, your self-motivation, those are the skills that you need to work on. It doesn't actually matter what you're doing. What matters is how you're doing it. Because a lot of you are also sitting here and you see, okay, she's gone into entrepreneurship. I will tell you, entrepreneurship is not easy. It's even harder than working at a law firm because at a law firm, everything actually comes to you. If you play the game well enough, you will get work, um, you will get promoted because the structures are really in place. When you work for yourself, nobody's waking you up. If, if I don't um, contact anybody, post anything, think about how I'm progressing things, no one is going to tap me and be like, hey, can you, you know what? We've heard all about Seize the Light and we'd love X, Y, Z. No one is doing that. But again, I have a very, I've worked on my willpower and that internal strength, and my why, and my purpose. So those are the things that are propelling me. It, it's 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 insignificant exactly what I'm doing. What's most critical now is how I'm doing it and how I'm approaching it. So I will wrap up by saying that for anyone who's interested in pursuing law, um, currently struggling uh, to get into the profession, in the profession and has a long road ahead of them, hone in on skills that are transferable. It doesn't matter what you're doing, what matters is how you're doing it. So if you focus on the how, the what will actually come. That's how you're going to be able to put yourself in a unique position that people will actually stand up and be like, hey, who's that person doing X, Y, Z? Take, uh, one thing I, I want to say before, um, and I know I just said I'm going to wrap up, but I just wanted to say you have technology at your advantage and you need to use it. Uh, for the Gen Zers uh, who are on the platform, you guys are so well versed in technology, but with some of the people that I work with who are Gen Zers, I am so shocked at how they don't capitalize on their technolog technological platforms. You have it at your disposal. Link LinkedIn is a great platform. You can use it, you can connect with people, you can get mentors, you need the right people. Get away from people who tell you it's impossible, get away from people who are going to tell you it's hard, and you might love those people, some of those people might be your friends, you've studied together, you were there at Hall 29 when it was hard, forget about them all, it is your own journey, you need to be 
laser focused in what exactly you see for yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Kanye. Thank you, Kanye. And talk about our team on LinkedIn. Plenty of people overseas also deal with all these channel challenges, and even the ones that were already there. Um, the fraternity is, as as many of the panels say, it's competitive, and but it is the the profession that we chose. So. I don't know how we can tell you that uh, you need to work at yourself in order to improve at yourself. And I noticed earlier that Dr. Cornelius Pesa, you had a hand up. Oh no, it was just me trying to find the correct um, reaction. I accidentally raised my hand. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So what we do now is we do what we actually came here to do, uh, to actually uh, give the platform to the attendees, those who have questions, those who want to engage with the panelists who have a particular question. Um, please raise up your hands and we'll give you the floor, or we can just read from the, from the chats that were conducting while the panelists were talking. So is there anyone? Cheryl, you want to? Cheryl? Yes, President. I actually do have a question for Dr. Fissa. Um, what are some common challenges faced by early, academic, early career academics? And how do you think these challenges can be overcome? Thank you. Um, surprisingly, a lot of challenges because I think your law degree is versatile, but it doesn't really prepare you for teaching a group of 600 students. I don't really think, you know, there's an easy way when you write your first article and it gets rejected completely. So I think there's a lot of challenges. And I think, you know, the one thing about being a lecturer, I think, and we are guilty of that, is doing smokes and mirrors. Because in class, we pre are prepared, we are confident, we know our stuff. But to get to that point actually requires an extreme, a, a lot of work. And I think, you know, I, and generally speaking to the questions, um, I saw in the chat about mentorship, and I think the question that you raise also speak to that. And that is, I think, what I mean by bravery. You know, it's not this uh, um, arrogant um, or arrogance and this um, and now I'm at a loss for words, this incomprehensible belief in yourself. I think, you know, bravery for me is believing in yourself, believing that you are worthy, believing that you are worthy of learning, that you are worthy of a human being who is accepting new experiences. And I think that opens and challenges your mindset, where you quickly realize, but I need help. I need help. And I think that's why mentorships are so important. And we, and it is at the beginning, a very daunting task, of course. But, you know, just striking up a conversation with a colleague and say, well, this is what I'm experiencing. Do you have any advice? And I think it's also dealing with the fear that other people may be judgmental and think that you are not capable. And the truth is the only person who thinks that is you. And I think starting as an academic or with any legal um, profession, there is a great amount of the imposter syndrome. And I think you have to realize you know, you don't know everything, but that doesn't make you an imposter. That only makes you 
a person on a journey who is refining and honing your skills. So that's why I think mentorship is also important. So I think it's also the ability to reach out to various people. I think everyone is indeed busy, but I think one would be surprised how willing other individuals are open to mentorship and the thing is with mentorship it is very goal orientated I think you know so what's the specific things you want to look at you know do you want to improve academic writing general writing writing for practice and things like that so focus on that what specifically do you want to achieve? So again, how do you attract or see a mentor? Well, law school or the law faculty is full of um, individuals willing to assist, but also platforms like LinkedIn provides an excellent opportunity because a lot of individuals are sharing very valuable experiences and I think connect with that work with that and show and I think this this may be um, an untold truth or a hidden truth but also show an interest in who your mentor are you know again this does not really matter for me but just to say to someone oh I have read your article on this and this this is so interesting tell me more is a better conversation starter than just saying um, how can you help me? So, as I said, it's a two-way street. And also be very careful of who your mentors are and also try to get to know them. And in the mentor-mentee relationship, be clear about your goals and what you want to achieve. If someone wants to be a legal practitioner, I'm probably not the best person to contact for those specific skills. Maybe I'm more attuned for life advice, general considerations and, thing, and things like that. But just to end off, don't be scared, be brave, reach out. You'll be very surprised what you will find when you are willing to reach out to individuals. Thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Cornelius Visser. Um, I'd like to also open the floor again for anyone who would like to raise up a hand. And Cheryl, does um, advocate, I mean, Dr. Visser answer your question? Yes, he did. Thank you very much. Uh, I actually have a question myself, if everybody's okay. Uh, I want to ask um, Kanisi Ile and Promise, because I remember you both mentioned something about receiving advice, not advice, instructions from a principal or someone higher up, and how it is important not to see that as criticism to you, but rather they're just advising you. Can you please elaborate on that? Um, sure, I can go. I don't know if Promise wants to go first. <laughs> Yeah, I'll go. Um, so, okay, my biggest um, thing is that there's two personalities, right? There's your personal personality, like this is can you see it? This is like how I am with my friends. It's chilled vibes. Then there's the work personality, right? And it's very important to distinguish the two because when somebody is criticizing your work. It's not an attack on your personality. It's an attack on your work, right? So that's why I say tap into, separate the two. There's a work personality. And if attacks at work happen on your work and things like that, that's that's for her to fix. And it's not personal. It's got nothing to do with my character. It's got nothing to do with why I'm occupying the space. It's got absolutely nothing to do with anything. It's just to make my work personality better. And I think the minute you remove yourself in that sense, and I know it's very hard, especially if you've worked on a brief <laughs> or you've worked on a note or an agreement or something, and you've put your heart and soul into something and somebody goes, oh, this is horrible. Why didn't you put this there? Why didn't you reference that? It's very hard to not take that as a personal attack. 
But I think once you distinguish the two and kind of just say, this is the work, they're criticizing the work, not me. Um, it, it's a different ball game. Also, I think what I always, always have to remind myself is that um, for me to be even able to get criticism means that I'm worthy to be here, right? Not a lot of people are here and on this platform to be able to, ex to receive critique on stuff that they've done. So take that in as well as you kind of move forward. Um, and then while I'm here, I just saw in the chat as well, there are like a few questions. Um, I'll quickly try to answer them. Um, so they've asked if specializing or being general, um, if we are exposed to different types of work um, and whether it's more niche. So it depends on the practice group that you're rotating in. I think for me, I've been fortunate enough to have been in departments where um, it's headed by three or more partners, two or more partners, and each partner has their own specialization. And it's really nice because you get more work from different places. So my one partner specializes completely on corporate law. Companies act, regulations, takeover regulations, that's their bread and butter. And specifically in telecommunications, broadcasting, and media, right? My other partner works in mining law and does completely mining related corporate work. So merges acquisitions in terms of mining law specifically, getting mining rights approved all over Africa um, and, and things of that nature. Um, they deal with that. And then I have another partner who deals with renewable energies. So that's completely different ball game. And, you know, having to put in bid submissions to the government and having to draft of those agreements. So I think your experience um, is defined by the department you're in, but it also doesn't necessarily hold you because if you go around and say, hey, I heard that you're working on XYZ project, could I perhaps listen in on a meeting? Um, and, and I think that builds rapport for you to get different experience from different places. I think you'll be actually so amazed if you just ask <laughs> what people are doing or what people are interested in. Um, you'll be able to get a lot of that. Work-life balance. Um, <laughs> it's very important. I think um, you kind of need to figure out. It's very, very easy to become just can you see the, the CA or the trainee who works in a law firm. And that's all I do. I sit, I study for boards, I go to PLT classes, that's it. Um, it's very important to find stuff outside of law. Um, and I think um, I've been very fortunate enough to have seniors who constantly ask me, like on a daily basis, especially when I'm about to, you know, if they feel like I've been working quite a bit, they're like, okay, what do you do outside of law? <laughs> Let's have a conversation for two minutes. What do you do outside of law, outside of PLT, outside of that? And if you can't answer that, then that's a problem. And I think that's where the work-life balance starts when you start engaging in those questions as to what is me outside of what I do um, and kind of taking that in. I love Bridgerton right now. I'm obsessed. So I am currently going to, after this call, go and binge watch the next part two of Bridgerton. But it's those little things that get you going every week, you know. Um, I think you really need to find your stuff. I also enjoy boxing at the gym. So it's finding what you love and kind of conversing and, and interacting with that as much as possible. Um, how do you handle a recurring errors? I write everything down. So for me, if it's not written down, it's gone. Um, <laughs> uh, often people will say instructions in passing and be like, I need you to do X, Y, Z. If you don't have a diary or a notepad, things start to get a bit crazy. Um, calendars or Outlook is your best friend. Um, I promise you, like, put everything on Outlook um, or on Google Calendar. Like, if you have a meeting, if someone says, oh, come chat to me in five minutes about X, Y, Z, put it in the calendar um, because it'll remind you. Um, if somebody says, oh, let's have a discussion on X, Y, Z, put it in the calendar. Also, what I've also noticed is just reminders for yourself to say, oh, check in on this email or check in on this person for X, Y, Z will help you try to keep in track of like those little reminders every day. Um, and the last question, sorry, this feels like I'm rambling, but um, the last question deals with second guessing yourself. I think it's very common um, 
especially in a profession where not everybody looks like you or in an institution or in a space where no, not everybody looks like you to kind of second guess yourself to be like, oh, do I deserve to be here? Like, um, what's going on? But I think, I think, you know, all the speakers have said it so beautifully and um, it's just realizing that you've earned your place and finding your why. And I think even being in that position is, an, is a testimony to your ability, to your skills, to your uniqueness, and to the reason that you've been brought onto this platform. And I think so many people overlook the fact that whether it's in-house, whether it's in academia, whether it's, you know, being an entrepreneur, you know, you've been brought to a place because you bring something special to the table. And I think if you constantly remember that and kind of diarize it for yourself, it becomes easier to, you know, get through the days. I know I have like affirmations of the week. So, <laughs> and I have a playlist in the morning. I get myself pumped. I have a Go Power playlist. And on the way to work, I play it um, and I have my affirmations. And sometimes it takes a minute in the parking lot to be like, I am good. I deserve to be here. Um, I am exactly where I need to be. And I'm going to conquer the day. And sometimes just saying those words enough times before you enter a space, before you enter a meeting, before you walk into the building, kind of gives you the confidence to get through the day. And so I think find your routine, find your affirmations, find your playlist, um, your podcast. There's so much available for you to just tap into um, to that, to know, that's like energy so that you can conquer um, the day. But yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Promise, did you have something to add or good? 100% covered by Kanye. Um, I think she touched on pretty much every question that was there. <laughs> um, but then I do think that I, 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 I want to add on to the point on criticism. And this is something that um, my firm has taken a, a, a sort of active role in trying to change or trying to um, re structure because criticism kind of works both ways you've got the person who gives you criticism and you as the recipient of that criticism so there's instances where it's very hard to tell if this is an attack on you or an attack on your work and then there's sometimes when it's very quite, it's quite simple to tell that you know what this is actually meant to benefit or to to improve the way that I, or you as the person receiving the criticism, um, work with it, or, or, yeah, something like that. Um, I'll make an example. So for us, uh, I'm in the mergers and acquisitions team, and uh, similar to Kanye, there's multiple partners in the practice, and you do receive criticism from different people, and you start to understand how people can can then contribute towards that constructive nature of criticism, like a uh, constructive nature of input rather, and say, you know what, look at this draft, right? And um, maybe you should try and do this, or maybe don't phrase that like this, or, you know, so it's it's something that you can get in a practical learning experience out of, where someone just goes, this is horrible. You know, they, there's, a, there's a clear distinction in the two kinds of criticism where one, gives you something that you take out of it and the other just gives you something negative to look at. You know, I, I don't know if you understand exactly what I'm I'm trying to articulate here because it's making sense in my head, but I'm just like <laughs> making sure that everyone understands it. Um, and then I also wanted to touch on the concept of uh, work-life balance because from the first day you walk in and you go work-life balance, you get this little look, or someone just laughs straight in your face and says, what life? Um, truth of the matter is there is a balance somewhere in between there. Um, so I like to think of life as something that's happening in between the work, you know? Um, Sometimes you can you can actually grab a coffee at seven o'clock in the evening while you like just take a break. So I, I work quite close to Santa City. I can actually just take a break, go to Santa City, grab a coffee, come back and continue working. And 
nothing is really affected by that um, ability to take away a minute for yourself and to and to allow yourself to readjust, reposition, refocus, and then come back with a clearer mind. Because it doesn't help anyone if you're there from eight to eight the next day, but really nothing came out of it because you got stuck or you couldn't move past something or you just sat there in your chair and just thought, if I sit here long enough, something's going to come out of it. I mean, there are times you have deadlines and you do have to deliver on when you're deliverables, but um, whenever you can and you have that moment to really just take a step back and and live your life. So that can be at eight in the evening. It can be on a weekend like now. Uh, Kanye just mentioned going to watch Bridgerton. I was actually just looking at um, the fact that the boys came out. So I'm about to watch a lot of the boys, but probably around like two because I do have another meeting. But um, See, it's 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 that structuring of your day. It takes a lot of you to be in control of that. I mean, for so much of your day, especially as a candidate, it's not yours to decide what you do with and how you spend your time. But whenever you do have that opportunity to decide, then please make sure that you do something that makes you happy and something that gives you joy, um, a hobby, a sport, um, and yeah. Yeah, so, so different firms also have different projects and they do, especially at my firm, one of the things that is prioritized is extracurricular activities. You know, we've got a paddle club that's there for people who do enjoy paddle. We've got a book club. So, you know, there's, there's varieties of ways to even incorporate a little bit of your own joys and happiness, happy moments, in fact, while on the job and within those those hours or just slightly after that. So I, I do think that's something that people should also consider when thinking about where they want to work. Um, but yeah, that's just a few things that I want to touch on, but can you pretty much touched on everything and I couldn't agree more. Okay. Thank you, Promise. Thank you so much, Ne. Um, yeah, work-life balance was, is very important. And I first want to ask who else has questions. They can raise up their hands. I have a question, but it's directed to Chidi Show. And Cheryl has a question. And does anybody in the in the group, uh, I see we have, how many people still join? 21 people. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak? I'll give them the floor. Let me see. I saw a hand. Hi, President. I put my hand up. It's Nombulelo. Okay, Nombulelo. Ask a question. Yeah. I posted it on the chat. It's to it's for Dr. Vis Visa, Advocate Zanele, and Kanye Shabalala. My question is, there has been an increased discussion about the quality of legal education in South Africa. The general consensus is that students leaving university are not prepared for the profession. I would like to know your thoughts on this. And also to Kanye, I would like to ask, would you say the legal education you received in South Africa prepared you for working in a foreign country? Did you, did everyone get my question? Yes. Okay. Um, colleagues, if you don't mind, I would like to respond to the issue of legal um, education, if it's fine with everyone. Um, I think, to be brutally honest, it's a question has all this time. Even when I was a student, you know, there were doubts about our um, legal training and qualifications. And I think this also speaks to what Promise has said about the anxiety of having a BA, BCom, and then an LLP. 
be. But I think the important thing to remember is that the LLB was created, the four-year LLB was created to maximize access, firstly, to the profession. And I think, you know, a reality that we need to face is that legal education is very expensive. People don't have the luxury to do a BA, BCom, or an LLB and an LLM. You know, let's not kid ourselves and say that education comes easy and is freely available to everyone. I think there are extreme challenges. But I also think, you know, from Luke, and obviously I cannot speak for the whole of um, legal educators or even the university, so I am going to add a disclaimer there. But I think, you know, we are tasked to provide a lot of skills, a lot of knowledge in four years. And I think, you know, as academics, we can respond, but we want five, six years or even more. But the space we are working on is four years and that's not a deterrent but that is to try our best to have a mixture of foundational knowledge skills and also those which are transferable to practice and I think the important thing to remember is when we speak about what and how we teach is that we are mindful and that we are having those conversations not only within our respective schools or faculties but through widespread co collaboration and through various individuals and I think you know, for me, there has been positive developments that, you know, and I think in th this counts for every law school or faculty, is that we are starting to introduce a diverse range of skills, which is focused on various areas such as academia and practice. So maybe just to give an example of how we are actually responding and dealing with students being prepared for the world of work out there is, for instance, that we are, are also introducing and um, cementing more practical type of skills. So, for instance, in the law of delict for the past few years, you know, we decided that a legal memorandum the legal opinion is a very important document to know because it works as a basis for other types of document. Look, I'm not saying it's the it's going to end all problems, but in delict in the course, we require students to draft legal memorandums for all the assessments. And I think, you know, that enables to create various transferable skills. And I think that's also the important thing to remember with the LLB. We are looking at base skills. We are looking at skills which can be transferable to various contexts. And I think also skills that can be further developed in practice because as we know law has many fields and divisions so to get through them in four years is a creative process but I also think you know as I said in the chat this is not being in silos. This is not saying, well, we are doing this and you're supposed to be doing that. And I think that's where soft skills um, and collaboration is very important. And I think that various institutions grow continuously on this path. So this is the very best answer I can give at that at this stage. So thank you very much for asking that very important question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bix Dr. Bisson. It was a pleasure hearing that. Uh, it actually made sense. I also thought at one point that uh, the LB degree should be extended to two years. Uh, no, to seven years, and. The amount of time that it needs, because uh, after finishing the four-year program, we still have PLT, we still have all these other various um, learning things that add on to. Yeah, I now realize that we're going over the time, but I would like to also 
add one more question and then we'll close to give everybody time to enjoy their Saturday. Um, does anyone have a question or should I ask the question that I was gonna ask to Chidisha? Anyone can, anyone can. Okay, Cheryl, you can speak. Okay, so this question was also for Tidisho. Um, Tidisho, what are some of the common mistakes that new candidate attorneys tend to make? Hi, Cheryl. Um, I saw a hand up from Kanyisile, I think. Was it Kanyisile or Kany? Oh, hi, yes, it's so from Kanyisile. It was me. Um, I was going to offer to answer the question in the chat, but I'll um, address it after Cheryl. That's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Cheryl. Before I get to answering it, I see there's a very important question there from Ale, I think it's Ale Gria in the chat box, uh, which advocates Anel answered very well. But I just want to add there, the question said that what advice would you give someone who graduated a long term and still struggling particles? One needs to consider that searching particles is a numbers game. So the more applications you can put out, the higher your probability of getting articles. Keep on sending those applications, and that's that's the best advice one can, can get. Uh, but common mistakes. The... the the one common mistake, and, and, and I'm going to talk in relation to myself, uh, and, and this is the biggest one, and, and, and I think it's a hinder, as, especially if you if you can't get over the sort of issue. And this is not taking criticism very well. I know we've had this <laughs> a while because Abraham is spoken in about criticism. Um, and particularly where I work, my principal is this method that she she that was used when she was doing articles whereby you print a pleading or whatever document you've done if she's going to go through with the red pen and that makes you feel like you're still in school and it could be an attack on your personality but if you're not able to get over something like that and not see it as an attack uh, on you uh, but rather see it as a way of building the way that you, you are able to work across uh it's it's you're, you're not going to survive and it's one of the the biggest mistake that you can make. So take criticism very well. Yeah, I think that's, that's the best answer I can give to that question. Thank you, Chidi. Okay, did you ask your question? Yes, I did. It's the one that he was answering now. Uh, um, Chidi Show? Ask you one quick one Sorry. and then we'll wrap it up. Wrap it up now. Sorry, okay, just uh, before you asked. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to add actually on what uh, Chibiko just said right now. And um, I think one of the most uh, problematic things that we tend to do as candidates is fearing asking questions. Like when you're given an instruction, you tend to be scared to then go and ask a question afterwards. Like you, you, you somehow feel like someone you're going to get judged for asking that question, or someone's going to think that you you don't know the answers. And it's okay to actually not know the answers because it's in not knowing and accepting that you don't know is when you really learn. Um, and being able to ask those questions, like for example, you're given something you've never you've never done before, and you just go, okay, I've got this. And then you sit at your desk for five hours and then you write an entire thing and you realize that you didn't even understand the instruction to begin with. So you really shouldn't be afraid to ask questions, especially where you don't understand or something is new to you. Or even if you just need to get clarity on something, just always try and ask help. It may not be from maybe the, the partner who gave you that work or from that, that work provider, but you can ask your peers, amongst your peers, or someone in a slightly higher um, role than you, someone with a little bit more experience. So you, you really do use um, that platform, as a, especially as a candidate, to ask questions because that's the best time to do it.
thank you, Promise. Thank you, Promise. Um, it was a nice addition to Chidi Show's answer. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to take the floor before we close? Uh, can you still need to respond to my question, President? Hello. We can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um. So just to add on the criticism point, because it ties into the question, I was just going to say it, it's quite imperative that you get good at taking the criticism because what everyone is talking about now is, you know, sort of knowing how to maneuver, working with a few different um, work styles. But that changes when you, for example, leave that firm. Uh, different firms even have different working styles. So what necessarily works in one firm might be perceived as completely wrong in another firm. And that sort of ties into the question about international experience because it's kind of the same thing. Much of what you sort of learn and study in South Africa um, may not necessarily perceive, be perceived as correct within the international market just because things are done so differently. So it's quite critical to build that thick skin. Um, do I think that the academic, I'm gonna address the question from a work perspective and a studying perspective. When it comes to studying, I will say that I definitely think that the VITS LLB equipped me to requalify. Um, it gave me the confidence uh, from an intellectual perspective to, to actually pursue that requalification. But I will say that imposter syndrome definitely does kick in because, I mean, University of Sydney is quite a highly ranked university internationally. And the lecturers are not supportive into understanding the jurisdictional differences between South Africa and Australia. So there is a lot of background work that goes into pursuing that requalification. If anybody ever wants to pursue that, you just need to keep in mind that it doesn't necessarily mean what you're doing in South Africa is incorrect. There's just different ways of doing things. Um, and when it comes to work, that one is another ball game. Um, there's a lot of jurisdictional differences. And for example, when you move overseas, there's something called a discount. So they will actually discount your experience. So in South Africa, let's say, for example, if you were a three-year qualified lawyer, when you move across to the UK, you'll be a one-year qualified lawyer. So you need to be able to manage your ego at all points because you will think I've already overcome the hill in South Africa. I've learned how to manage my principal. I've learned how to draft. But then you move to the UK and then you're starting all over again with a new audience, with people who don't think you know anything. So the faster you learn how to build that resilience and have that attitude of um, always approaching your day with what can I learn and knowing that you're there to learn from them and nobody's really, nobody owes you anything and nobody has to come and meet you where you are. You actually need to pull up your imaginary socks and meet them where they are if you actually want to uh, pursue that ambition of working in an international market. Okay, thank you, Kanye, thank you. Um, I would like to close off the meeting unless someone else has a question because we have run over the time by 20 minutes. And also, I would like to apologize for the mishaps in the beginning. Um, it was touch and go there for a couple of minutes. Uh, so sorry to the panelists and sorry to those who are there. Uh, so is there anybody who has a question for I think? Uh, President, okay. I'm not sure if Advocate Aisha is online or if she wants to say a few words. Maybe five minutes. Five minutes? Um, Advocate okay. Aisha? No, I don't think she's online. Uh, so, But we did speak that um, I, I should put. Okay. Noted for the so, uh, so we've reached the end of our panel discussion. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. And yeah, um, next time will be better. Now I have experience. This was, this was actually my first panel discussion, organizing and doing everything. But we 
next up we'll have other discussions planned for Women's Day. Uh, we're going to plan and we're going to plan with Kanye Chabalala, especially Kanye, who sees the light studios. And we're going to make the event even better than what it was today. So thank you for your time. Yeah, this concludes our panel discussion and I hope you guys are better equipped to deal in the world and everything that comes with it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, President, our erudite speakers and our guests for joining us today. Malibongwe, this is such an auspicious occasion and manifest one of the multiple reasons that I founded South African Black Woman in Law. Alama Kosikazi Malibongwe, Vuk Ozenzele, Watint Abafazi, Watint Mbukodo, Ubuntu. Oh, yeah.